everyone. Welcome to Happy Hour. I'm Rebecca Gomez. And I'm Cody Willard, and this is where I do not have intel inside. <laughs> you don't? No, yes, no intel do. inside. <laughs> hey, I'm excited that uh, Stephen J. Canal is here on the show today. This guy is an amazing author, and he's responsible for thousands of programming TV, uh, programming hours on TV. Dozens of actual TV shows the guy's created, most of which I think I've spent way too much time in Rudoso, New Mexico, on a couch <laughs> watching. And now, excitingly enough, is that a word, excitingly, excitingly enough? Excitingly enough. I think I my mom's going to go with me yeah. on that one. It's, uh, yes, now, end. some of those popular TV shows are going to be turned into movies. Movies. Absolutely. And the other thing that's very exciting is that over time, over the next two or three years, you will have instantaneous access to every single one of those shows on sites like YouTube, but not quite there Cody, yet. We are just so excited today, but we aren't excited about the markets. Hey, the market's closing at their lowest level yet for 2008. Uh, granted, we're only two weeks into the session, but anyway, uh, bulls looking for uh, in, to Intel for a blue chip breather may be disappointed. The big chip maker missed profit and revenue estim estimates. We'll break that down in a moment, but first, let's get right to those closing numbers, everyone. The Dow off 277 points, the NASDAQ also getting hit falling 60 points, the S&P in the red, 35, the Fox 50 lower by 23. Well, the not-so-unexpected dour news out of Citigroup took down most of the financial stocks today. We'll break down the Citigroup announcement in just a few moments. Technology shares also not faring well today, despite Apple's debut of a super-thin laptop called MacBook Air and an online movie rental service. We'll get into that. Chip stocks were down, AMD and Micron, Intel reporting earnings after the closing bell, and we'll get to that as well. Applied Materials, however, was the exception for the hammer tech sector. It was up following cost-cutting moves, including layoffs. And more weak retail sales figures, this time for the Commerce Department, also weighing on the markets today. But let's uh, break down Intel, first of Intel, all. Intel, I tell you, it's, uh, overall, the, the numbers are not terrible. They're basically in line with what everybody was looking. They're really not too shabby, but the fact is the, don't, the market needed something better it looks like the stock's down 10% after hours. It's going to be a bloodbath out there tomorrow. That makes me very excited to buy. I actually would like, if I were trading money tomorrow, <laughs> I, you know I've been hesitant trying. I would, I, I, it's certainly in Intel, I would open up a position in Intel starting tomorrow, get a toe in the water over the next few weeks, build it up to a full size position. But I mean, the thing down below 20 when the thing is still growing, right, and the, right. it's a real growth in the stock, real growth in the fundamentals. This is one that I think actually can sort of avoid the recession because of the secular growth in the PC industry, because of Apple's new initiatives, and because of. Microsoft Vista. Well, and also, you know, its chief rival, Advanced Micro Devices, you know, it's still having trouble gaining market share. It seemed like it's, you know, uh coming into a lot of problems as a company, as an organization, you know, with, with that in particular. And I also wanted to mention the uh, Intel chief financial officer. Interesting enough, as you mentioned about the weather, it's being hammered by an economic slowdown. He's saying we did not see a slowdown over the course of the fourth quarter. And we're a little bit cautious based on what we see in the U.S. economy. But he also notes that the U.S. accounts for less than 25 percent of Intel's overall revenue. And quote, he says, we're not seen signs of economic recession. What do you know about that? I got a question. Do you got AMD inside or just go go inside? <laughs> I'll take a little. How about a little bit of both? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and also you mentioned that uh, uh, Intel, you know, you're, you're positive on it as far as long term because of its its agreement with Apple, and sure enough, you know, Apple I mean, now debuting today that super thin laptop called the MacBook Air, uh, and it will have Intel chips in that. And, but just to be clear, the, uh, the Apple itself is not the driver for why I like Intel, certainly is a small part of it, but the, the Vista cycle that everyone has been saying isn't happening, it right. is still happening, and it is causing some secular growth in the PC industry, which means it's not necessarily dependent upon that broader economic cycle, but PC growth it, units are moving and that's good for Intel every time another mm -hmm. PC is sold that is good for Intel they don't have that even if the costs and the economy drops for the pieces themselves Intel doesn't have to cut their prices until they want to certainly not with AMT faltering well you know and then with the uh, with the Apple announcement today its stock still got hammered you know and, but it's a, a lot of people were really excited when you listen to I mean granted these are people who really follow the technology world and love probably Steve Jobs so every time he he unveiled 
something new out at the conference in San Francisco. They were, ooh. She must be ready to change oh, the world again. But no. But, but you know. that is a super cool laptop. And I tell you, you know, the laptop, we always talk about the iPhone and the iPod, but the la the Macs of the world account for about 60% of Apple's revenue. Right. And when I picture owning Apple, you know, I, I owned it for many years. And when I try to picture owning it for the next several years, what I think you always look at is that they have basically won the digital living room, the content distribution into the digital living room, whether you're talking about movies, television, yeah. or obviously music with the iPod. They have won that game, and it's going to take some major disruptions to even come out close and disrupt Apple over the next five years on that. Intel's going to try to follow their, you know, go on their coattails and, and ride that wave. Absolutely. Well, we've heard all day about Citigroup's big problems, more bank earnings on the way this week. The candidates, the presidential candidates, are hitting the banks, uh, trashing them basically from the campaign trail. Senator Hillary Clinton said those sovereign wealth funds pose a threat to America's economic sovereignty. Can I just note, I actually agree with Hillary Clinton Hold for the up. first time ever on this Breaking show. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, can we run that banner? Uh, Kevin Hassett of McCain Advisors calling for a federal law that prohibits sovereign funds from having voting rights over U.S. shares. Meanwhile, Congress is calling on a bunch of bank chiefs to testify about the subprime mess. Well, joining us now, Rob Nichols. He's back. He's the president back to the show. of Financial Services Forum, and that is a non partisan organization comprising of the CEOs of 20 financial services, including the, a lot of them will we talk about on this Some show. Of them, absolutely. Definitely. Happy so what do you mean, me, make specifically of the presidential candidates uh, basically saying that, you know, they may, if they're elected into office, whichever one, will crack down on these sovereign right. wealth funds? Well, I think, first of all, I think sovereign wealth funds are an important part of the global economy today. And I actually think it's important that we do welcome foreign investment in the United States, but with a couple caveats to that. Foreign investment is different from sovereign funds investing. No, I, under, I understand that, but we're, we're in a converging global economy. We want to invest overseas. We want folks to invest here. But not so governments. Good, well, hold on. When we, we want, I think, good investment policy goes hand in hand with good trade policy. And there's, so let's talk a, a little bit about the sovereign wealth funds and a couple of aspects that I think but are important. Before you, we should right. explain to our viewers that these are the governments of like Kuwait right. and the governments China. of Saudi Arabia, China, Nor Norway that are actually has a sovereign wealth investing fund. Alaska them. has a sovereign wealth fund. But yeah. we're talking about these four, you know, the ones that Understood. are questionable, the right. ones that the presidential candidates are having problems with. Right. Well, it, um, uh, here's what I would say specifically surrounding some of the some of the proposals on the sovereign wealth funds. I think it is important that we attract foreign investment here. I think sovereign capital also can be very welcome and play a welcome role in our economy. But there's a couple of things that we should think about. One, the Treasury Department right now with the EU and the IMF is looking at coming up with a set of global best practices to look at transparency and disclosure. We welcome that effort. We think that makes a lot of sense. Secondly, when we're talking specifically about sovereign capital, I'd like to remind the viewers that it was just, what, six months ago that Congress passed a brand new uh, process to review from a national security standpoint all of these transactions. It's called CFIUS. It sounds like a cold. It's not. <laughs> it stands for the Committee on the Foreign Investment of the United States. And that and that process takes a hard look at each of these right, investments, right. makes so, a so judgment. There are some things that are starting to be done. I have a lot of confidence in that time, process. The, the, the issue is that these governments, the, like we wouldn't allow the United States government to take a 10% stake in Citigroup. Why are we allowing the Chinese government? There's to a difference do it? between the U.S. government picking winners and losers in our own free market economy. But I I think it's a sign of confidence in our capital markets and in the financial services how is, sector how is itself. foreign governments, we are so desperate for capital that we are Despite selling our private institutions they're making to foreign governments, and you're saying that that's a good sign? I'm saying they're, they're making investments despite the current market conditions. We, these are innovative companies, they're profitable companies, and it's a sign of confidence in our capital markets and specifically in the financial right, services so, sector. So, the money is going to be invested. Right. So the money is going to be invested somewhere. Who's and confident? I, think as I know, long, but let me go back to the have, subject at sure. hand, the presidential candidates right. having problems. Now, what I've read is that the reason they have the problems as well is look for look down deeper into the road. Say the Chinese government has a problem, or the Saudi Arabian government has a problem with with the U.S., and so they pull out all their money, and it, it basically leaves the, the some sure. of our investment banks on uncertain ground, right. and then that could hurt our economy. Right. Basically, it, they are like controlling our economy. Right. The num well, they're keeping the numbers underneath historical 
historical uh, control norm. So where they don't have a seat on the board and, and things of that nature, they're looking for long-term returns. So they're looking to, they are not looking to make. that's a lot of money that they're investing. All of a sudden foreign governments are economically incentivized? Come on, that's and, a joke. No government is ever economically incentivized. They're always politically motivated. No, not all governments are politically voted. For, for example, in our in our case of Alaska, Alaska is trying to diversify its own its own wealth. They have a lot of natural resource wealth. They're taking their money and they're looking at other long-term investments. And that same thing is happening overseas. As long as we have a thoughtful process in place to look at the national security aspects, as well as a, as they develop a set of global best practices, I think it's extremely important for us to keep our borders open to foreign capital. Rob, I got to say, I'm always against socialism of all forms, and I certainly don't want it permeating into our capitalist system. Yeah, and well, it's good to at least also to hear that they the banks are at least taking some safeguards. But we'll keep we'll keep tabs with Rob and. We'll and have you back, sure man. Talk much again. more about What's this as it gets Happy worse. Happy New Year, guys. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> On tap next.